All right, now, the title of my sermon this morning is called Take Control of Your Life. And this is actually very similar to a sermon I preached called Planning for the New Year. And if you haven't seen that already, I know a lot of people are out of town, a lot of people are gone. That was, I believe I preached that on Christmas night. So if you haven't had a chance, to, and I don't normally, you know, plug my own sermons in church, but this is a very important sermon that I think is applicable to just about everybody in this church. It's not geared specifically towards any one person, just as this morning's sermon is not either. But I'm going to be kind of elaborating even further on, the, on that sermon. So if you haven't heard that one, look it up uh, in your spare time and give it a listen. I think it's going to be very important, especially for this church. There's a lot of things unique to this church from other churches I've been in. We have a lot of problems with um, not the people. You know, people are great. There's not problems within the church per se. It's physical problems and spirit, you know, and, and, and these you know, a lot of pain and sickness and, and problems that are kind of keeping people out of church and keeping people from serving God because people have, and, and, and look, I'm not going to say they're not legitimate. A lot of people have very legitimate, I mean, we have a lot of people missing today for legitimate reasons. People are sick. There's, you know, there's things going on. And look, if you're sick, I don't want you coming to church. <laughs> Keep your disease at home and get better and get well and then come back to church. That's not exactly what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of people, my wife is one of them, that deals with pain on a regular basis every single day of her life, there is a lot and a lot of pain that has to be dealt with. And there are many people that have come through this church and are members of this church that have the same exact type of issues. Okay, and I want to try to edify you and encourage you this morning and, and help you to take control of your life. And the main point is I don't want you to have to be... Um, you know, a slave to your circumstances. We ought to be able to decide what it is that we want to do with our life. We, we have a goal. We have a vision. You have something individual that you want to do. And it ought to be so motivating that any circumstance that you have, any pains, other problems, aren't going to prevent you from doing what you really want to do with your life. See, what I don't want to have happen is too many people living out their life day to day and just, oh man, I'm tired, oh, I'm in pain, oh this, oh that. And then you look back and you say, wow, I really wish I could have just stuck it out a little bit more and done a little bit more for God. And, and this is where I'm feeling that, that too many people will end up if we don't make decisions about it early on and just decide, hey, I'm not going to let my body dictate what I'm able to do. I'm going to let my mind in my heart dictate what I'm going to do according to God's will. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So he's saying we don't faint. You know, faint is when you're just going and you just pass out, right? It's where you're, you, just, you just stop, you can't work anymore. And this is, you know, the Apostle Paul is a great example of someone who didn't faint Someone who had lots of troubles, lots of persecutions, lots of adversity, even problems in his own flesh. He said there was you know, a, a thorn in his flesh. A, a minister of Satan was sent to buffet him, right? And, and he had this thorn in his flesh. And he besought God, you know, God, help me out. God, help me with this. Three times, and God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And God said, no, you have to deal with this. And he did, and he dealt with it. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't quit. He didn't let that stop doing him doing the work that he had to do. So we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse number 1, he says, We faint not. What I don't want to have, and see, this is, there's, a, there's a specific attitude that we want to avoid. Some people just try to get through every day as if every single day is like this huge mountain. It's like, oh man, I'm just trying to survive. Just trying to get through day to day. Now look, there may be times in your life where you kind of feel that way, and I get it. Okay, you have a lot of things coming at you at once. But what I'm saying is that this ought not to be your just daily, every single day, being in a position where you feel like, I just can't go on anymore. I can't believe I made it through this day. Oh, tomorrow's another day, and you're not even looking forward to the next day. And every single day... It's like, I like to call it, uh, and, and maybe it isn't 100% accurate, but like an AA attitude, you know, because they say you got to take one day at a time. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with taking things one day at a time. 
Okay? There's nothing wrong with that at all. We should, you know, we take things as they come to us every day, but the, the point is on the attitude. Is it, are you looking at, at your circumstances as, you know, you're already being defeated and you're just trying to make it through each day? Or are you going to look at it as, you know what, there's some challenges, I've got some obstacles, but I'm going to, you know, have the right frame of mind to, to overcome that and really start to move forward and push ahead and push through what's going on. The, you know, the, the way that your outlook is has a huge impact on what you end up doing. Jump down to verse 7 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, amazingly meaning his, our flesh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This is an important point to remember. We do have an earthen vessel. We have flesh. We have ailments. We have problems in our flesh. So when we do do great things for the Lord, the glory goes to God. It's not our... And, and look... It says the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You need to get to that point where you have the faith to be able to trust in God, for God to strengthen you and God to give you the power to get through. There have been many times now since I've just in the short time that I've been pastoring in the past three years where I know that it hasn't been through my own power that I've been able to even run a service just from my own physical ailments. And look, again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to lift myself up in any way, shape, or form, but I'm just telling you that it's real. That God's strength is real. It's something that works. But you have to have the faith and you have to push yourself. If I didn't push myself to do it and just, and just lay down and just said, well, I can't do this, I'm giving up, then I would have been a failure. I would have just give up and I would have done nothing. But if I say, you know what? I, I need to do this. My will is going to be stronger than my outside influences, than the outside pain, and the, or the inside pain. I'm going to just move forward and do this. You know what? That's what we ought to be doing. You're going to get an accomplishment there, and you know who's going to get the credit? God. God gets all the glory for giving you even the power to work through that. Verse number 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Now this goes to the, to the mental outlook, to the way that you look at things. Being troubled on every side. Think about it. You have trouble everywhere you look. There's trouble, there's trouble, there's trouble. He says, but we're not distressed. We're not just ready to throw up the flag and say, I'm done. He says, we're troubled, but not distressed. We are perplexed, which means, you, you know, you're confused. Why is all this stuff happening? But not in despair. And despair means when, again, you're throwing up your hands. Well, I don't know what to do. Everybody's coming at me. Everybody's attacking me. I don't know what's going on. So forget it all. No, that's the wrong attitude. You can have trouble on every side, yet not be distressed. You could be perplexed, but not be in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. You know that it's going to end. You know that when you're facing persecution, persecution, God's not just forsaken you. You're going to go through it for that short time, but then you're going to come out like gold, tried by the fire pure, and you're going to come through much stronger than when you went through. It says, cast down but not destroyed. We need to keep this outlook of knowing, hey, things might be going bad. I might be dealing with problems, persecutions, pains, whatever the case may be, but I'm going to keep moving forward because I know that this is not the end. Hey, if God was done with you, you wouldn't be here right now. Amen. I firmly believe that. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That's a pretty strong statement. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That does not sound very comfortable to me. The dying of the Lord Jesus being born in your body. It says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Sometimes in order to serve God, we, you know, there is no other route. We have to go through that. We have to bear our cross daily and, and suffer the things that need to be suffered in order to do the will. And, and see, the problem is when Satan finds out what your weak point is, whatever that may be, for some people it's sin, right? Specific sins in your life that Satan just says, oh, hey, all I got to do is just throw a little booze in front of them, 
throw, throw uh, some scantily clad women in front of them. Throw whatever, you know, whatever it is. And this guy who's serving God right now, he's going to get out. He's going to quit because this is going to distract him. Well, what if it was not just those types of things, but, you know, uh, other, other circumstances in your life? Oh, wow, all he had to do was get a flat tire. Now he's not coming to church for a whole week. Well, that's pretty easy. <clears throat> or some kind of pain. I mean, look, and look, I'm not trying to dis, you know, to discount or, or say that it's, not, it's nothing. You know, I would never say that to my wife, that her pain is nothing. But you know what? She, she has to push through it every day and, and find that way to, to have the mental strength to just say, you know what? My body is not going to dictate what I'm going to do today. I'm going to dictate what I'm going to do today. Jump down to verse number 15 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Bible says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. And this is, again, another part of the attitude that's going to help you to keep pushing forward. All things are for your sakes. The more you focus on yourself, the more amplified your problems are going to be. When you're just sitting there thinking about me, oh man, I've got these problems and I've got this pain, and all you can do is think about yourself, it's going to be that much worse. But when you start to think of other people, when you start to think, you know what, we've got a soul winning time this afternoon, you say, yeah, you know what, is it, is it raining right now? Did it start to rain? I can't tell. It looks like the ground's a little bit wet. It's cold. It's rainy. I've got the sniffles. You know, I'm not feeling that good. I just want to go home and take a nap. You know, when you just keep focusing on yourself, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go home and take a nap. You're going to go home and just sit down. You're going to do nothing. But when you start thinking about other people, you say, you know what? There's going to be other people at this soul winning time. I need to encourage them. There's going to be other people out there that are going to be dying and going to hell. I need to be thinking about them. That helps you to have the right men, you know, mental state to push forward and say, you know what? I can deal with this. There's so many more things that are more important than just these little ailments that I have right now. This stuff that I have going on. And maybe it's not little, but maybe you can still find the way to push past that and do more. And this sermon, is an ex it's not an expectation of, you know, if you have legitimate concerns, which almost everybody does in this church, to just say, oh, it's like they don't even exist. We know that they exist. But are you just letting that dictate everything that you do? Are you going to try to find some way to, to do a little bit more, to push a little bit farther ahead, to keep moving forward? Verse number 16 for which cause we faint not. There he mentions it again. We faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You need to have that renewal because the more outside forces that you have, you don't want your inward man, the motivating spirit to be knocked down also. We need to renew our mind day by day. And you know, one of the great ways to do that is by reading God's word and praying to God and, and having that open, you know, calling on God, asking him for help, asking him to be, you know, to give you the strength and relying on him will help to renew your mind day by day. Verse 17, and, and this, is, this is amazing, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is the perspective. Now, of all people that we know in the Bible, for the Apostle Paul to say our light affliction can help you to put as a frame of reference maybe what you're going through. He calls it light affliction. He goes through, um, in another chapter, all the things that he's been in. You know, he's been shipwrecked. He's been stoned. He was, you know, left out in the deep. He's been in perils of robbers and perils of his own countrymen. And, you know, all these, all of these things happening to him throughout his life. I mean, think about it. Like, he, he was, you know, whipped. 
he was, you know, beaten up. All of these various things happened, attacked, and it's like he calls that light affliction. This this light affliction that we have. I don't know anybody who's come close, and personally, I just don't know anybody who's come close to the amount of things that the Apostle Paul went through. And then for him to call that light affliction, he says, it's just light affliction for a moment. This is the type of outlook and the perspective we need to have on our life, is that we, it, it may seem like it's really difficult and there's all these things going on, and, and it's just the end of the world. But if you look at the grand scheme of things, and you look at your whole life and realize you know what? What is our life? It is but a vapor which appears for a moment and then vanishes away. We are here for a very short period of time. Time flies by. And these, these moments in our life where things seem to be so bad, it's really, in the grand scheme of things, just a light affliction that will pass. And when we can look on the things that are not seen, the invisible things of God, the rewards that God has for us, the, 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 the beauty and magnificence of heaven and the mansions He's prepared and, and ruling and reigning with Christ, and we think about these things, then we could be more motivated to understand that what I'm doing here really matters and how much do I want to work for those rewards. The things that are here that are visible, these are all just temporal. Everything's going to be going to go away. You know, we don't think it's that big of a deal for people to push themselves to earn a lot of money. You look at that and say, "Oh, well, yeah, he's just a hard worker and he's, you know, people are driven today, many people are driven to make lots of sacrifices, to move to various places, put in, you know, 80 hours a week, 100 hours a week. To, to make money and they're that driven and they don't let sickness, they don't let other things come in the way and the world looks at that and says, yeah, okay, well, he's driven. He's, you know, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. He's maybe is someone to even look up to. But what about someone who's got that type of desire for serving God? And that's where, honestly, that's where we all ought to be for serving God is have that type of desire, have that sense of sacrifice to be able to look forward and say, I'm not going to let these little things keep me back. I'm not going to let my pains, my ailments, whatever the case may be, my situation, my circumstances determine what I'm going to do for God. I'm going to serve Him and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have faith that God can open up doors for me. I'm going to trust that, that He's going to, you know, I have the heart that's willing. Here I am, Lord, send me. And rely on Him to allow to open up. What, and, and look, I realize some people are physically incapacitated. But when you have the right desire and you have the right faith and you're praying to God, God can open up doors even for someone who's physically incapacitated to do great works for God. I, I believe that completely. Uh, you know, I think it's found all throughout Scripture that it's... That it's um, God's willing to use anybody, and God's strength is made known in weakness. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Just a few pages back. We're talking about taking control of your life. You being in charge, not your circumstances, not your, not your situation, and not your belly or your own lusts. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24. <coughs> the Bible reads, <coughs> Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's likening the Christian life to a race. He's saying, I run also. You have the, the race that people run in this world, you know, the physical races. You look at the Olympics and people run races, right? And they do that in order to achieve a physical crown. They get a medal. They get whatever, you know, some type of accolade, some type of reward for winning that race. And he says, well, I'm also, I'm also running a race. But I don't do it as uncertainly as they do. 
Because I know that there's a crown waiting for me. I know that I can win this race. And, and um, he says, so fight I not as one that beat at the air. But here's the key. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. In order to run this race, you need to be in charge of your body. Your body needs to be subject to you. So you meaning your will, your spirit, your mind taking control of yourself and being able to bring your body into subjection. Say, no, I'm the boss. I'm going to say what's going on here, not you. I'm not going to follow every single lust of my flesh and just indulge in every type of sin because that's what my flesh wants to do. No. And look, and, and for people who, who win the physical crown that are striving for the masteries here on earth, you know, they have to do the same thing just in a different context, right? They need, to, they need to be very well disciplined. They need to keep their body in subjection. They need to be careful with the food that they eat. They need to be uh, uh, willing to train. And if anyone's ever been in sports before, I have, when you're training and you, you're working out and you're doing things, you know what your body tells you? Stop, I'm tired, this hurts. But you know what your mind has to do? Say, I'm gonna keep moving forward anyways. That is extremely valuable. You know, the one thing I'm, I'm extremely glad that I did as, when I was young is get involved in sports and to learn that type of inner, you know, like a, just a personal strength to understand and go through and have the experience of what it's like to push yourself when you're in pain, when you're not doing well, when, when everything around you is telling you just stop to keep pushing a little bit more. And to push and strive a little bit, a little bit farther, to get a little bit more strength, and and to achieve even more. Turn back, if you would, to First Corinthians chapter six, just a page or two to the left from where we were. I've got a few different points on on taking control of your life because the life is real general. We want to take control of your life. You want to take control of your body. Make sure you're not you know, just submitting to the lusts of your flesh. But you also need to be able to take control of your health. And this is something that, that many people struggle with, especially in America today, is the, the attraction and the allure of the sweets and the sugars and the, the things that you know are bad for you, that's not good for your body, to, to ingest all these great amounts of sugar and, and, and processed foods and just, all, just a, very, a variety of, of different things. You need to be able to <coughs> deny that type of lust, deny that fleshly desire if you want to take control of your health, of your life in that manner. Look at verse number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And this is a great verse to use, and we're going to read a little bit more, when you're thinking about your health. Because there's many things that you can do or maybe consume or eat that aren't necessarily a sin. Right? We're not talking that, that oh, if you have that cookie, you're sinning. Right? That's, that's not the point. But the point is saying, look, and he's saying here, you know, all things are lawful for me. Why? Because we're free from, 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 the law, from the curse of the law. You know, I can do basically whatever I want. I still have eternal life. I'm still a child of God. But I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. I'm not going to become a servant and become a bondage to sin or become a bondage to anything. Because once you become addicted to things, then I believe it does become a sin. When you have this addiction, and it doesn't matter what the thing may be, it may be something as stupid as video games where, okay, well, where's the sin in that? Well, you're wasting your time. And when it becomes this addiction you can, and you cannot just, just do without it, that's when you, you've been brought into bondage. And it becomes a sinful event at that point. And food can be the exact same way. And, and look, I want everyone in this church to be healthy, especially around this time of year. We got a lot of sickness going around, a lot of people getting sick. My family has just been sick for the past week. And your body needs to be well equipped and prepared to fight off the disease, to fight off the infections, to fight off all these flus and bugs and everything else that's going around. And in order to do that, your body needs to be functioning the way that God designed it to be with the proper nutrition coming into your body that supports all the energy and immunity that your body needs. So um, 
Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, the main context that, that is being used here is fornication. Because fornication is a very grievous sin. And we see here, you know, hey, you're sinning against your body. You're sinning against God. You, when, when you're joining yourself to another person outside of marriage, he says it's wickedness, it's sin. But I think we could also make an application of this because he's bringing up our bodies, right? And the reasoning for not, you know, getting involved in this fornication and fleeing from it, he's saying, look, you're bought with a price. You know, the, the body that you have that is a temple of the Holy Ghost and you're not your own. You belong unto God. And, and you look at, you know, he's talking about the, you know, shall you take your bodies, the members of Christ, and, and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. Well, <coughs> what about just ingesting, you know, poisons through alcohol, drugs, and, and, and even just, just, just horrible food that's going to destroy and corrupt your body? You know, I, I don't want to just take this too far, you know, because you could take it to just some extreme where, you know, people are going to say that, well, every little thing that you do is going to become a sin. But no, there's, there's, a, there's a proper respect that we ought to have, though, for our bodies, knowing that we need, you know, we have a job here to do. We are to be workmen. We're supposed to be doing a job for Christ. And how are you going to do that if you just destroy your body and you just let yourself become real gluttonous and, and you have all these health problems? All you're going to be doing is, is incapacitating yourself. We don't want to get yourself in a situation. And look, many people already have gotten themselves in a situation, but, um, you know, and they have to try to figure out how to work through it. But I'm, I'm trying to preach this message so that if you haven't gotten yourself too far over that cliff, you know, the, the big thing these days is diabetes. And where does that come from? It comes from a bunch of sugar. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 5. You need, to take care, you need to take control of your life. You need to take control of your health. You need to take control of your walk with God. There's a lot of things that, that we ought to be doing, as I just mentioned, as far as our service to God. And you need to take control of that. You need to take control of, of what you're doing for the Lord. It's, it's, you know, the first part is knowing what I should be doing. What should I be doing for God? Well, read your Bible and come to church, and, you, and, it'll, get, and, and it'll start to become more clear what you should be doing in order to serve God. That's the start. So if you haven't even gotten that far yet, start doing that. But I think pretty much everyone in this room has already gotten past that point. You know what you're supposed to be doing. Take control of your walk with God and start doing it. Say, this is important to me. I'm going to do this. <coughs> I'm going to get to that point actually in just a minute. I think I have these out of order. You need to, I had you turn to Ephesians chapter 5. You need to take control of your family. So I'm going to start with the men. Men, you need to be a leader in the home. You have a family, you have a household. It's time for you to step up and to be a leader. You're supposed to be the one that's setting the rules of the home. You're the one that decides what goes on in the family. You are the one that God has ordained to be in charge of your household. Don't defer everything to your wife. Don't defer everything and just say, oh, well, whatever you want, just, and just let her become the boss. That is a poor leader. That is a very poor leader. That's what, you know, the, the, you know if we want to uh, put it to in a political sense, right? You've got the, you know, we have all these checks and balances in our, in our government between the, the legislative, executive, and judicial branch, and they're all supposed to be working together. And what we've seen in this country is that the Congress has just been you, letting the president have all of this power and getting rid of its own power that, that was ordained justly through, you know, through the, the founders of the government. But, um, 
and giving all that power up to the president and getting it out of whack and then you end up having a lot more problems because those balances were there for a good reason. But what men are doing in the home is they're saying, well, you just do everything. You decide everything. And that's wrong. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. You know what it means to be the head? It means you're in charge. It means you're the boss. The husband is the head of the wife. This is what the Bible reads. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, normally, we are applying this verse to the wives, and, and look, wives, you need to pay attention to this, but husbands, you need to understand where your place is in that home. And you need to step up and lead. And look, whether you want to do it or not, that's the job that's been given to you. And you need to learn how to be a leader in your home. And it doesn't mean being some fascist dictator. It means being a leader. It means being able to lead your household. That's why one of the qualifications for becoming a pastor is one that ruleth well his own household. And when you rule well, people have respect for you within your own household. So it's not just some... Oh man, this is just a total dictator. I'm living in fear all the time and I don't want to do anything wrong. That's not a good leader. That's not a good ruler. A good ruler is someone who can lead and get people to follow him voluntarily and, and people will have respect for them also. So in order to do that, men, you need to lead by example. If you want something done, you want your family to behave a certain way within your house, you better not be doing the same thing. You better not be a hypocrite because nobody has respect for a hypocrite. Sarah, go sit down right now. Now let's look at the women. Women, take control of the home. Get your duties accomplished and lead your children. If you have children at home... You, you are the one who's been given the duties by God. Again, God ordained to be raising your children. Get your duties ac accomplished. Command your children's respect by teaching them, by loving them, and by disciplining them. They need all of those things in order to respect their parents. You can't leave any one of them out. You can have the discipline all day long, but if you don't have the love and if you're not teaching them right, then ultimately it's just going to be a, it's just a, a sh very, very shallow level of respect. Like I said, it's, a, it's like the leader who just rules by fear and just everyone's just in fear of them. Well, you're not going to have their hearts. And once they get old enough to get out of there, you're going to end up having not raised a proper child. And they're going to go the way of Satan. But you need to love them. You need to give them the nurture. You need to, to, to show them. You need to teach them. But again, now you need to discipline them. You know, it, it's a shame when the, the disciplinarian in the household is only the father. I don't believe it should be only the father or only the mother. I think both parents should be taking part in this because it is extremely important and the kids need to realize that they're being watched by both parents and they're not just going to get away with things just because they're under mom's watch, not under dad's or under dad's, not under mom's. It's a two-way street there. You know, you have two parents raising the children. Now, it's primarily the wife's job because the man's supposed to be off working and making the money to support the family. But both parents need to be involved in that. Proverbs 31, 28, you don't have to turn there. This is, the, of course, about the virtuous woman. The Bible reads, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So the virtuous woman has a family where the kids rise up and they call their mom blessed. The husband also praises her. Wow, what a great godly woman this is. And if you want to have the children and the, the, the respect from your children and from your husband. So look, just because the husband's in charge doesn't mean he can't respect his wife and show respect on her and, and, and bless her and say, wow, how great my wife is. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, diminish any authority whatsoever. But if you want these things, read Proverbs 31, ladies, because it gives you a good example. You see an example of a woman who works really hard. And we're talking about taking control of your life. Here's an example of a woman who stays up late and gets up early. Now, I don't know anybody in the world that stays up late and gets up early and isn't tired in some regard. 
Your body is going to be telling you, I'm tired. But you know what the virtuous woman does? She stays up anyways. She gets up early anyways. She does the work anyways. She takes a hold of the spindle and the distaff. She makes clothing for her household. She goes off. She gets her food. She takes care of all the business that she needs to take care of, regardless of her circumstances, regardless of how tired she is, regardless of how hard it is to do all that work. She does it anyways. And as a result earns the respect of her family, of her children, of her husband. And she's blessed. And the Bible praises a woman like that as being a virtuous woman. We need to take control of our priorities. And this is really what it boils down to. This is where we need to have... Um, and if you, if you walk away with nothing else, I want you all to think about this point. I want everyone's attention. Think about this point right now. Consider your daily life. What you do on a daily basis. Think about what you did this past week. What were your activities? Think back in your mind. What did you do? You went to work probably, right? You ate some meals. What, how did you spend your time? How much time did you spend doing the things that you did? Now ask yourself, what's important to you? If you were to make a list and write it down, I encourage you to do this later on. When you go home this afternoon, when you go home tonight, write down a list. What is important to me in my life? What do I want to accomplish with my life? What are the things that if someone were talking to me that I would say that I value? Right? For me, I value God. God's number one in my life. I love the Lord and I want to serve the Lord. My wife, my children, my family, those are, those are right after that. Immediately, they are very important to me. What else is important? The church, other people, everyone, you know. And look, you make up your own list. Think about your values. What's important to you? Is making money important to you? you know, now, for men, you know, making money is important because it falls under the category of you know, providing for your wife. You, know, you love your wife and kids, you're going to provide for them. You're going to support them. You know, th so, so some of these things are going to have to fall under the priorities, but you have to understand, what do you really care about? Now, I'll ask you this. It's, it's easy to say out loud, oh, you know what? God's number one in my life. I love him. Right? It's easy to say that. And, and you could say, well, that's the right thing to say. And that's where I should have my priorities. But does your life actually reflect that that is your priority? Now think about that. How much time do you dedicate? I mean, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? <clears throat> At what point in your day are you even thinking about the Lord? Is he really number one? Or your family, for that matter, or anything. You know, think about whatever your priorities are and say, do my actions, does the way that I live my life actually reflect? So if someone, if I didn't tell anybody what my priorities are, could someone else write down the same list that I have as my priorities based on my actions that they were able to see everything that I do every waking moment of my life? If it's not lining up, you need to make changes you need to do something different you need to, to to take control of your own priorities look i'm not going to make your priorities for you, you got to do that for yourself determine what is important to you what do you want to do with your life where do you want to end up but once you decide that you can't it's not just enough to say well this is what my priorities are you gotta you gotta form your life around those priorities say this is what's important You can only achieve your goals, your priorities, the things that you set up by having discipline. You need to discipline yourselves. And this is, you know, the main point of the sermon basically is just having that discipline, being able to look at things in the proper perspective, being able to push past. And that's what it is. When you push past pain, when you push past the, the circumstances in your life, it's having discipline. It's being able to say, here's what's going on, but I have the discipline and I have the will to move forward and keep doing whatever it is. You must be disciplined, first of all, and, and you know, this might sound odd at first, to submit. To be in submission. So, ladies, you must be disciplined in order to submit yourselves to your husbands in all things. Now, because your first reaction is going to be like, I don't, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. I mean, that's, that's everybody's first reaction is going to be, I'm going to do what I want to do. But if you're going to do what's right, we already saw in Ephesians chapter 5, 
that the wife is free in submission to the husband in all things, it takes discipline, it takes temperance and self-control to say, no, this is actually what's right. You know what? I have regard for God's word and I have regard for my husband and I'm going to control myself and submit. You must be disciplined, Christian, to submit yourself to the Lord in all things. So even if you're not a lady, you know, talking about husbands and wives, look, we all have to submit to the authority and to the laws of God. That, and hopefully that's a priority for you. But in order to do that, you need to be disciplined. You need to have self-control. You need to, to be able to control yourself in order to submit. You must be disciplined to fast. Now, turn if you would to Ezra chapter 8. And I bring this up because I think uh, this is a very good help for people who are trying to take control of their life, trying to take control of a lot of different things. Doing a simple fast will help you to do that. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a small thing that you can do. But there's many, and you know, this isn't a fasting sermon. I preached it before. There's many reasons to fast. And this is not a primary reason to fast. But it's one of those things that I do believe will help you in the end. And, and, will, and will help you to strengthen yourself and your own resolve and your own will when you choose to do something. Because with a fast, you're choosing... In your mind, you're saying, okay, for this amount of time, whatever that time may be, it could be 12 hours, a day, two days, three days, whatever. You're saying, I am not going to eat any food or I am not going to eat any food or drink any water or you know, whatever your fast may be. You're, you're deciding in advance. You're saying, this is what I'm going to do. The most, typical, the most typical fast that I've heard of is just people are going to say, I'm not going to eat anything for one full day, for a full 24 hours. I'm going to wake up. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to eat anything until the whole you know, next morning again, whenever I wake up again, then I'll end my fast. And what you're doing there is you're dictating to your body and saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to afflict myself and endure the affliction of my body, the physical desires saying, eat, eat, you know, go get some food. Oh man, you smell that? You could, and when you fast, you can smell every food that's being cooked for miles around. The longer you fast, the longer it goes. I remember fasting and I've been at work when I used, back when I used to have my motorcycle. Oh man, driving home around dinner time and it was like nice outside and people are barbecuing and it's like, oh, that smells so good. And all you want to do is just eat. You want to stop by and knock on the door. Hey, you got another rib? You got <laughs> something? Because I'm hungry. But when you're fasting, you're saying, no, I'm in control. My belly's not going to dictate what I'm going to do. I am deciding. And, you know, we fast for the Lord. It's a fast to, to, to pray unto God and, and, you know, and to get God, God's attention stuff. You're in uh, Ezra chapter number 8. Look at verse number 21. Bob reads, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. So, I mean, we get right there a pretty good definition of what they're doing. The reasoning for their fast is we're going to afflict ourselves because it's not fun to fast. It's not something that's enjoyable. It's something you have to go through and you endure it. And they're seeking a right way from God. They're calling out to God and say, God, you know, we're afflicting ourselves. Help us. We're fasting. We're proclaiming a fast for you. You know, give us the right way for our little ones, for all our substance. Verse 22, for I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken on the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So, like I said, there's a lot of reasons to, to and there's many more reasons to fast in the Bible. And, and fasting is a good thing. And I don't want to just boil it down to just this one thing. But this is something that you can... Um, when you do fast, you are demonstrating that you're in control. You're demonstrating that I can go through this, and with my mind, I can just make sure that I'm, I'm going to, to endure this affliction. <clears throat> and this truly is freedom. 
when you are in so much control that you're not bound by anything, even eating food. See, I'm not bound by that. I can choose. Am I going to do this? Am I not? Am I going to eat food or am I not? Am I going to get involved in this sin or am I not? Am I going to go out and do the work that God has for me to do or am I not? That is having freedom. When you're not just some slave to your own lusts. Turn if you go to Romans 6. It's the last place we're going to turn this morning. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, when you can take control of your life and, and of what you are going to do, and, and especially when it comes to sin, in Romans 6 we'll be covering just, just sin in general. When you can take that control, you are truly free. You know, people, it's, it's funny because... People look at the Christian as being the slave and, oh, you have all these rules and, and you can't do anything and you have no freedom in the Christian life. But what they don't understand is that it is freedom because it's our choice to follow these things or not. Look, we all have the free will to do this or not. But when you choose to live by a set of rules... You're not a slave to those rules. You're a slave to the sin. You're a slave to the things that are going to prevent you from living by those rules. When you are choosing to live this certain way, it's not because you're under the bondage of doing that. It's your freedom to say, this is what I'm doing. Right. And when you have that, I mean, that freedom, freedom is indescribable unless, you, unless you've done it yourself. Look at verse number 11, Romans chapter 6. <coughs> Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Let not. He's saying don't allow it. Don't allow sin to reign. How are you going to do it? You have to do that with your will. Because... The, the nature that we have, our flesh, the natural thing is sin will reign. If you don't do anything about it, sin will reign in your mortal body saying, don't let it. You make the choice. You decide, I'm not going to let this happen. You need to be resolved for that not to happen. I will not let sin reign in my mortal body. You need to take control of that and do it. Everybody in this room is going to say, well, I don't want to sin. Of course I don't want to sin. I don't want to break God's laws. But what are you doing about it? It's not enough just to have that desire. You need to, to put it into action and say, I will, you know, it's not going to happen. Instead of going from, well, I don't want it to happen to it's not going to happen. Verse number 13, neither yield ye your, your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Because of the infirmity of your flesh. Because our flesh is weak, he's saying. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. He's saying, as in the past, you've already, you know, made yourself servants to uncleanness in the past. You've already done that. And, and just as you have done that, look, I know your flesh is, has weak, is weak, 
But now you need to yield or allow your member servants to righteousness. You need to choose to do what's right and, and to put away the uncleanness and the iniquity that your flesh is prone to because it's weak and to decide that you are going to now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. Verse number 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He's saying, what good was it? When you're involved in all those sins and all the things that you did in your life, what did it produce for you? Nothing, because the end of sin is death. He said, it didn't do any good for you. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, this goes back to the eternal versus the temporal. The temporal, the things you can see here, the eternal, you can't see. But we have to have the faith and trust in God of what's going to happen <coughs> when we die and in the future and everything else. We need to take control of our lives. Let's not let our life, our circumstances, our pains, our ailments, the, this flesh... This, this, this weak, sinful flesh determine what we're going to do with our life. Let's renew ourselves in the inner man. Let's make this decision. And look, I was serious about the priorities thing. Go home later and decide what is important to me. What matters? And what am I doing to make sure that those priorities are being met and, and are actually in place? Because I'll tell you what, the people who's you know, there's a lot of people out there that would say that would probably have really good sounding priorities. But when it comes down to it, it's, well, I'm going to do anything I can to make sure I don't miss this TV show. I'm going to do anything I can to make sure I don't miss the big game or the Super Bowl, the World Series or baseball, you know, whatever the case may be. That shows where your priorities really are. If you're willing to skip church, skip family, ch you know, skip other things for, for some other activity, you know what that says? That's where your priority is. You say, but it's only for the Super Bowl. It's not for the, you know. Okay, then it's only for the Super Bowl. Then your Super Bowl becomes your priority. But think about that. Are you willing to put that over, you know, the rest of your family or wh whatever? I mean, whatever you're claiming to be your priorities. They're not really, you know, Take a good, hard look at yourself and, and determine what are, what are the priorities I want and what are my priorities in reality and in practice. And then try to work to change those things. Take control of your life. Push past. We, get, we, we have a very limited time on this earth. Let us push, push, push ourselves to do the most. Whatever that may be for you, the most that you can do for God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these encouraging and edifying words, dear Lord, and the examples that we have in the Bible of men that have been through so much, and especially you, Lord Jesus, the, the, the amount of pain and anguish and suffering, the things that you went through, and the, 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 the tiring and the hours you stayed up praying at night and, and walking around and, and preaching the gospel and, and doing all the work that you did. You didn't have a place to lay your head. And for three and a half years, Lord, you, you just focused on other people and, and, and were concerned about them and not your own circumstances. You didn't let those dictate what you could or couldn't do. God, we love you. We thank you for that. I pray that you please help us to learn from your example and the examples of the other great men of God, dear Lord that we can do the best that we can for you. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.